I was going to start with, a, with my welcome, but I won't. Um, uh, those of you that, that know me, and, it, and I know a number of faces in the audience, and uh, therefore I, I presume it's reciprocated, um, will we'll know that by temperament I, I tend to be something of a skeptic. Um, and what I want to do in these uh, few minutes that, that I'm uh, going to be able to speak to you today is to raise um, some questions and put, throw down some challenges. Because I think one of the biggest dangers in a new field is that we believe our own narratives. Now, every new field, as it's establishing itself, as people are coagulating around a new area, it needs to create its own myths. It needs to create a narrative that serves to sustain it and enable it to grow. Uh, and this is true for all fields, and it's definitely true when one thinks about digital economy and the intersection of digital economy with substantive domains like transport. And the nature of that narrative is important. Um, if it's a successful, persuasive narrative, then it will have the effect of pulling others along <coughs> with us and aggregating experience, aggregating interest, aggregating value. <coughs> but we should not deceive ourselves as to the role of such narratives. Such narratives are essentially selling propositions. And they're not, that's not the same thing as, I believe, what should guide a scholarly and academic enterprise. So what I want to do is to identify three or four themes that I think are part of the narrative that has been constructed and that we are all jointly responsible for. Um, and then to raise some question marks about whether those uh, elements in the narrative are effective not as ways of presenting to the outside world and not as ways of selling a proposition, but as ways of guiding our thinking. And I want to do that because uh, I think meetings like this will be most successful if there is an edge, if there is difference of view, if there's conflict, if there's genuine interaction between different ideas. There's nothing duller, nothing more tiresome, nothing more innovating than going to a meeting where everybody agrees with everybody else. And I want to ensure that at least there's one contrary voice, and I'm going to make that mine. And I hope that, that uh, in doing so, I'll be able to um, stimulate some interesting discussion. So that, that's, that's what I want to do. So what's the narrative? It seems to me that, that the narrative that we and a number of other groups are, have bought into and have promulgated uh, over recent years has a number of components. Firstly, the narrative says there are these fantastic new data resources that we never had before, uh, which have tremendous potential if we use them in the right way. The second element of the narrative says there are these tremendous new analytical capabilities which enable us potentially to do tremendous things with these new data sources. Thirdly, there's the, there's the element that says there are all these incredibly important new problems that we didn't have before that are demanding that we respond in new and different ways and those earlier elements, the new data and the new methods, give us a way of doing that. And finally, the fourth element of the narrative is we'll all make money out of it. That there is the opportunity to create significant new streams of value that will be beneficial to society, to academics, to business, etc. Et now, I've got an element of skepticism about all four of those elements. Uh, both in terms of their absolute truth values and in terms of their, their appropriateness as a guide for scholarly activity. Let's take the first one, that there are these fantastic new streams of data that we didn't exist before. But actually, that's not true. There aren't fantastic new streams of data that didn't exist before. Almost all the data that 
one could imagine as being relevant to a consideration of transport or urban transport has existed in more or less the form that it exists now for 10 years or more. The one exception, arguably, is social media data. But then no one has found anything remotely like a useful application for social media data. So I would say the first proposition is far from true. Let's look at the second proposition, that there's some fantastic new analytics out there that we didn't have access to before that are opening up new possibilities. I'm sorry to say, there aren't. No one's discovered a, a new mathematics in the past 10 years. What they have been able to do is repackage a lot of existing statistical and machine learning technology quite effectively under a new brand. But there's very little that's new. Third, that the problems have changed. And that somehow there's an urgency about dealing with a set of problems now that didn't exist in the past. Well, again, I would be skeptical. We're broke now, but we've been broke in the past. So what's new about being broke? We're told we're threatened with particular sorts of environmental hazard now. Well, we've been told that for a long time. I'm old enough to remember when the hazard was global cooling. Now it's global warming. Maybe it will be something else in 10 years' time. There's very little new under the sun there either. And finally, the business of making money. When you look at how money is made at the moment in this space, it's still predominantly made through advertising. The model that friends Google and others created and refined so very successfully many years ago. So there's very little that's new there. So we have a rhetoric that is useful. It's got us to here. It's created a momentum. But in very substantial ways, it's not true. Now, that doesn't matter at one sense if what we're seeing how we see this rhetoric, how we see this narrative, is purely as a selling device. Very little that's done in the name of selling is true. However, if we believe it ourselves and allow it to guide the way in which we think about the research challenges and the way in which we deploy our energies and the way in which we shape the ambitions of our students, then I think we'll be guilty of a significant lapse in judgment. And I think part of the challenge that you all have today, and all of us working broadly in this area, is to move beyond that narrative, to think more deeply about what's going on here, not allow oneself to be carried along on the wave of these convenient but essentially fatuous arguments to think about the fundamentals and to engage with the subject area at that level. So that's my message to you. I'm being deliberately provocative because I don't like agreement and I don't like consensus. So please, fit, I, I'm not sure what the timing is like, John, but if there's a few moments for questions, then I'd be delighted if people could yes, get back to me and, and get that debate going. And we have somebody ready to raise some challenge. Yeah. Could you just introduce, uh, introduce yourself? Uh, gladly. Um, ben Heidecker from uh, UCL. John, uh, fantastic. Thank you. You've succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I would. Um, but I, uh, rather than take, go through the whole, whole agenda, uh, I'd just like to address making money and uh, benefit to society. And I think in transport studies, it is worthwhile just to distinguish between the two. There are many activities we undertake in providing a service to society uh, that don't make money but improve the quality of life. And uh, the one that I will flag up in particular is improving road safety. We don't make money out of it. We might save the health service money. And we might save the economy money. But uh, we don't get cash back for it. So I think that's an area where it's worth investing our efforts, uh, even if it doesn't uh, fill our bank accounts. 
I, I wouldn't disagree at all with that. Um, well, I'm disappointed you're supposed to. No, no, no. <laughs> my, my point was, I mean, if you want me to, to, to find a, a grain in which I can disagree, I, I would just make this point, not specifically about traffic safety, but more generally, that I think we should be all be sceptical, uh, a little sceptical, um, when uh, public interest arguments are rolled out. Because um, it's ever so easy for public institutions to define the public interest as coinciding with the interest of those public institutions themselves. Um, and that is why one finds that whenever a problem is identified in the public realm, the response to that problem is generally, generally to create more government to solve it. And one should not be surprised when such responses are, are forthcoming because they align with the objectives of the bureaucracies that are advancing those solutions. So whilst I, I you know, no one could disagree that, that safer transport systems are a good, a good thing, no one could pro disagree with that proposition, the, the thing we need to guard against is entirely reasonable propositions like that being used uh, by uh, self-interested institutions as a means of creating extra bloat that we all end up paying for. And the same goes for almost any other problem that one could identify. And paradoxically, the more unassailably good the ultimate objective, saving lives, preserving the planet, the more unassailably good the ultimate objective, the more useful that becomes as a mechanism for institutional bloat. Because how could one possibly criticize? If you take one more, I think there's a quick question. Um, you were first. I'm Audrey Lenzel, Imperial College. Um, I, just my sense of it in terms of uh, the, uh, the new problems is you're, you're right, there are no new problems, but I think the public's perception and their interest in, the, in improving their own health has grown a lot, and a lot of that can be done through transportation, and a lot can be done through new data, including participa participating <coughs> citizens with uh, smartphone data. So there's new data streams and new uh, consciousness of improving health that I think is something <coughs> I mean, I'm, I'm obviously saying very obvious things, because I think that's what you were asking for. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I don't disagree. I mean, you know, I've got one of these little bands on myself that, that tells me how fat I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, the question I would ask here is, is not whether there are lots of little things going on. <coughs> there clearly are. And some of them will be worthwhile. Some of them might even make money. Some of them might even, in some uh, unalloyed sense, <coughs> be in the public interest. Um, the question I would ask is, are any of them really disruptive and transformational? Disruption was one of the words in the, in the, in the planning of this event. And transformational change. Oh, absolutely. That's the UK mantra. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. Does any of the stuff that's going on come remotely close to hitting either of those targets? And I, I think uh, the answer is no. And maybe, maybe that's because the transformational change and blah, 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 all that stuff is just another marketing narrative that another bureaucracy, the research funding bureaucracy, uses to justify itself to its funders in government. So we have another narrative that we should recognize for being what it is and not buy into it, but as it were, allow it to wash over us, but to assert our fundamentals. And our fundamentals must be about knowledge and scholarship and truth, not about the ephemera of this or that changing narrative. And on that provocative note. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.